to introduce you real quick? Yes, Chef, we are ready. That's fantastic, fantastic. All right, students, so uh, for the next little while here, we are going to have the pleasure of having Chef Austin Bonetti and Chef Jeff Harris uh, from Johnson & Wales. They got to tell us a little about not just Johnson & Wales, but about higher education and further education in general, and also big things in there, things like how to pay for it as well. Pay attention, be thinking about if you have any questions about any of these things, because uh, they have a wealth of knowledge. They know so much about all of the different uh, ways of making this work. Okay. All right, Chef Austin, please take it away. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Chef. Greatly appreciate you and greatly appreciate uh, all your support over the uh, past few years that I've been working for you. So thank you. My pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. And hello to all of you students there. It's very nice to see you all. I don't know if you all have seen me before. Maybe you saw me last year when I came to speak to you guys uh, before everything kind of shut down. But my name is Austin Vanetti, and I'm an admissions classroom presenter with Johnson & Wales University. And I am based out of our campus that's closest to you all, uh, which is right in uptown Charlotte. So not far away at all. And I'm also joined by my coworker, Chef Jeff Harris. He's the one that's behind the scenes, kind of running the cameras and everything like that. So I wanted to introduce him as well. And uh, before we get started with my whole presentation here and then uh, cooking for you all today, which is which what I know is the most exciting part, but I wanted to give you all a little background information on myself so you can get to know me a little bit, see as to uh, kind of how I got started into the culinary world and might be even a little bit similar to uh, the way you got started as well. And uh, then we're going to start cooking a little bit. We'll talk a little bit. We'll cook a little bit. Just kind of go back and forth today. Um, but I got my start with cooking uh, maybe around the same time as some of you all did. In fact, my freshman year of high school, I signed myself up for a foods class. Now, I wasn't anticipating on becoming a chef or anything like that at that point in my life. I was just trying to fill up my block schedule. There was an open block and my guidance counselor that was helping me set up my schedule said, pick an elective. So I said, okay. I was looking through all these electives. None of them sounded fun, but then I saw there was a foods class on there. So I said, what's the worst that could happen, right? And I signed myself up for that foods class. And when I was in that foods class, I really got interested in cooking and really had fun with it. And I enjoyed learning about it. And my teacher kind of saw that little bit of interest that I had. And she told me, she said, hey, Austin, look, what I am teaching you and what this class is about is it's a very basic class. It's like a home economics class. We're barely scratching the surface with culinary. There's a whole nother culinary program at the high school. And you ought to think about going into that after you get done with your freshman year. So just like you all have your career center there, we had something similar to what you guys have. And um, I went to that culinary program, stuck with that for my sophomore, junior, and senior year. And uh, I even worked at a few restaurants when I was in high school. Um, I did anything from washing dishes and bussing tables to working prep stations, to being a line cook, to being a server, a little bit of everything. And uh, come my senior year in high school, I started doing what a lot of you all here are probably doing now. If you're not doing this now, I think now's the best time to go ahead and start doing this. But I started planning out for after high school because the end of high school is going to come to an end for you very, very fast, right? It's going to be here before you know it. And just like a, a chef has to be mise en place, meaning everything in its place for the dish that we're creating, we have to do that for our next steps in the world as well. So you're going to have to figure out, are you going to go to college after this? You're going to go to a community college. You're going to go to a state college. You're going to go to a private university. Um, are you going to go straight into the workforce? What is it that you're going to do? And I don't know is not a good answer. So you need to make sure that you're figuring things out. So I started doing that. So my first go-to with colleges was community colleges. I know it might sound weird, to hear somebody that represents Johnson and Wales University tell you that Johnson and Wales University was not my first choice in schools. I was looking at community colleges purely based off of the cost because I was under this impression that the sticker price of colleges, like if you Google the cost of uh, uh, said college, whatever college it may be, I thought that that price was what you actually had to pay. And there was no way that I could afford that. But I didn't know that much about financial aid at that point in time. Um, but we learned a lot about that. We'll talk about financial aid a little bit later. So I started looking at community colleges. Then I started looking at state colleges. 
Um, then I started looking at some of the bigger name culinary schools like Johnson and Wales University and the Culinary Institute of America. And I visited every school that I was interested in because one of the worst decisions you'll ever make is a split second decision on a college that you've never been to. You have to look at these schools. You have to visit them and see, is it not only financially feasible for you? Is it academically feasible for you? Is this school going to offer everything that you need to achieve your ideal career, you know? And so that was definitely something that I looked into. And one of the last schools that I visited was Johnson and Wales. And I'm really, really glad that I did because not only did I fall in love with the campus here in Charlotte, more so I fell in love with the way that Johnson and Wales structures their curriculum. It's so much more than just culinary with Johnson and Wales University. And one of the big differences in Johnson and Wales and any other culinary schools out there um, is that we're going to expose you to so many different avenues and alleyways that you can take within the food service industry. And remember, I'll reiterate it here in a few minutes, but the definition of a chef this day and age doesn't mean what it used to mean back in the day. So here's how our curriculum is set up at Johnson and Wales. And if you are interested in culinary or baking, which I know is a hypothetical situation, I know you all want to do different things. But if you were interested in culinary or baking and you came to Johnson and Wales, your first two years as a culinary or a baking student is going to be primarily culinary and baking and pastry labs. So it is all hands on learning from day one. It's also in person as well. So with our culinary program, we don't do a virtual culinary program. Our students are in class right now with some restrictions. Um, and we've also limited the number of students that are in each class. <clears throat> so you're actually going to have about 10 students to one professor now. So think about that. You got 10 students in your class and one chef. So what benefit do you get out of that? Well, you're going to get to know your professors. They're going to get to know you. They're going to know what it is that you're trying to accomplish, and they're going to help get you to where it is that you need to be. You're going to be working with chefs that are private chefs, that are Michelin star chefs, chefs that own their own businesses, chefs that have been in the restaurant industry for a long time, chefs that have traveled all around the world cooking food for people. You learn from so many different people, and each one of our chefs have a different story and have done some amazing things. And these chefs not only become your professors, they become your friends and they become your mentors. And that's what you get with that small class sizes. If you're in the culinary labs, you'll take classes that range from classical French and Italian cuisine all the way to international cuisine, where every day you're in class, you cook food from another country, uh, to breakfast, lunch, and dinner style cuisines. If you're in baking and pastry, you might take classes that range from an intro to baking and pastry class to artisan breads, maybe a cake decorating class, maybe even pastillage, where you're working with sugar and you're pulling sugar and making sugar sculptures. Um, so you do so many different things, all hands on. You get to eat everything that you make. It's a ton of fun. Now, after those two years, your associate's degree is complete. And here's where things get interesting. In these last two years that you're at Johnson & Wales University is where you're going to earn your bachelor's degree. So do you see what you're doing? First two years associates, last two years bachelor's degree, two degrees in four years, not a bad deal, right? And with your bachelor's degree, you can earn it in an array of different things, culinary slash baking related. The most common bachelor degree that a culinary or a baking student will pursue is food and beverage industry management. It's a very well-rounded management slash business degree that you get. Um, it covers a little bit of everything. A lot of our graduates will go on to become executive chefs and this degree really helps them. Or maybe you wanted to even like manage culinary operations at a resort, hotel, cruise liner, maybe do like corporate fine dining, something like that. This management degree would be ideal for you. But maybe you want to start your own business. Maybe you are an entrepreneur and you have that entrepreneurial mindset. You want to open your own restaurant, your own bakery your own food truck, those are really popular now, your own cafe, or even a ghost kitchen, you wanna open up something like that. Well, you would go into our food and beverage entrepreneurship major, where you're gonna learn about small business startups. You're gonna learn about doing things like accounting and HR, how to hire, how to fire. You're gonna learn about doing profit and loss statements. You're gonna learn how to make money in the restaurant industry because, you know, chefs, we are very passionate about the food that we make. We're very passionate about our customers. We do love what we do. But if we're the owner of a business, we have to love making money because that's the only way that we're going to survive. 
So we have to know how much every ingredient costs. Like take this piece of garlic for an example. If I'm a restaurant owner, I need to know how much this piece of garlic costed me and also how much I'm going to sell this final product for. So that way, not only do I make up the money on the garlic, but I'm also making enough money to keep the lights on to keep the gas flowing so I can keep cooking food for my customers, so I can pay my employees and I can take money home for myself. You're also going to learn how to draw up a business plan and pitch that business plan to a banker or an investor because most people don't have the ungodly amount of money that it costs to open a business or open a restaurant, food truck, something like that, right? So where do they go? They go to an investor or a banker. And the first thing that you need when you go to get a loan from one of those is a business plan. And if you do not have one of those, you just say, oh, yeah, I got great ideas for a restaurant. They'll never give you the money. Right. So you have to know what you're doing with drawing up a business plan. And these are things that you're going to learn within that entrepreneurship degree. Now, there's a couple others that I like to mention. The next degree program is our culinary nutrition program here at Johnson & Wales. It is an ultra popular program here where we obviously dive into the world of healthy cooking. Right. But we learn how food can be medicine, how it can also be used as poison and how we can help people with certain dietary restrictions. So an example of what some of our graduates are doing, they're combining culinary and the medical field together, where our nutrition students are going on to be nutritionists and dietitians in big hospital systems like Atrium Health and Carolina's Medical Center and Carolina's Healthcare Systems, where they're designing diets for patients who have certain dietary restrictions or guidelines. Like for an example, if somebody comes into the hospital and they are uh, staying for a couple nights and they're diabetic, do they get to eat any type of food that they want while they're at the hospital? No, because they might eat too many carbs a little bit late at night. And guess what? That spikes your blood sugar up. Or maybe they have hypertension or high blood pressure. They have to eat a low sodium diet. We have to have nutritionists that can design diets for those patients. So if you've ever wanted to combine those together, hey, that's a great way to do it. But not even just with the medical field. Think about the world of sports. So a lot of professional sports teams as well as collegiate level sports teams are actually hiring our nutrition alumni to come and cook for their teams. Uh, a few examples of that, uh, the LA Clippers, if you watch NBA, they have Chef Priscilla. She's their executive performance chef. So she cooks food for all of those NBA players. Uh, the Chicago Bears have actually just hired a Johnson & Wales alumni to cook for their teams. The University of Alabama has a JWU alumni cooking for them. And even in our own backyards, Clemson University. Clemson University has Chef Donna McCain. Donna McCain is really the first of her kind. And she's the executive performance chef for Clemson football. And she's a graduate from our nutrition program. And she cooks for every single one of those players. She adjusts their caloric intake levels, their fat intake levels, their carbohydrate levels to make sure that they are able to perform at the top level. But she designs meal plans for them that are tasty. Because let's say that you're an athlete on a, on a sports team, right? And we give you a diet plan and we say, you are only allowed to eat boiled chicken, broccoli, and brown rice because that's what's going to fuel you for practice. Well, how likely are you going to be to cheat on that diet? Pretty likely because you know what boiled chicken, broccoli, and brown rice tastes like after you've been eating it for a while? Not good, right? It tastes really, really bad. So if we can fuel you with healthy fats, maybe using avocado oil um, or different olive oils, if we can fuel you with different proteins, using salmon, using chicken, using all types of stuff with seasonings on it, healthy seasonings, including vegetables in there, and making food taste really good and that's your meal plan, then you're going to stick to that diet a lot better than boiled chicken, broccoli, and brown rice. So that's an example of what some of our nutrition students are doing. And those are very high paying jobs as well. Uh, the last major that I want to talk to you guys about before we dive into our demonstration here today um, is our applied food science and innovation major where our food science students get down to the organic chemistry and the biochemistry that all relates to food. We have a lot of our alumni that go on to work in test kitchens where they're literally designing tomorrow's food. They're figuring out how to make food more shelf stable, how to make food look better, how to make food taste better. You know, uh, why do you think Oreo cookies taste so good? 
Well, they actually have research chefs that work with the recipe for Oreo cookies and the Oreo cookies cream, right? And they make sure that it tastes really good. You know, same thing with like McDonald's and Burger King and Taco Bell and all these fast food chains. Well, they all have corporate kitchens where they have chefs and food scientists that are designing their next hit menu item. So you could think about doing something along those lines. So that's what I want to remind you guys is that the definition of a chef this day and age doesn't mean what it used to mean back in the day. How many times throughout this first part of the presentation did I tell you working in restaurants? Not that many unless you're owning one, right? You know, I'm talking about things like food science and nutrition and owning a business or even think about your chef. What does he do? He teaches, right? You could go into culinary education. And that's the difference that you get with a school like Johnson & Wales is we're not limiting you just to restaurant work. It's a much bigger picture within the culinary and baking and pastry world. And it's really cool to see Johnson & Wales just leading that culinary revolution of the new age of chef. And um, it's really fun for me to be able to play a very small part in that, but I definitely enjoy it. So anyways, enough about that. <clears throat> I know that's a lot of information to uh, get through. So let's get down to business with cooking. So we talked a lot about nutrition, right? And today we are actually going to be cooking a very healthy dish. Now, I hope that doesn't turn you off because we're going to be adding so many flavors into here. It's going to be delicious, right? And I could this food to you guys. I know that you would absolutely love it. And, uh, but hopefully I'm But today we're making a nice seared steak salad with some flank steak. And we're actually going to make a uh, honey, ginger, garlic, and sesame oil dressing. And I know that's a lot into there. Um, if I was kind of creating a menu, I'd definitely call it something different. But we're going to put a ton of different things into this dressing. We're going to do some knife cuts. We're going to sear off some steak. We're going to plate it all up. It's going to look beautiful, all right? So um, let's go ahead and get started with everything, all right? So... What I have uh, underneath me are a couple refrigerators. And so you're going to see me throughout the first part of this demonstration, kind of going in here, grabbing our salad greens here, going in and out, because I'm a believer in cold food, cold, hot food, hot. So if somebody, if I go to a restaurant and they serve me a salad that's on a lukewarm plate and the salad's lukewarm, that's not good, right? We want to make sure that the salads are served cold. So I'm going to keep this very, very cold. You also notice that I'm wearing gloves because all of this is ready to eat food. So I want to make sure that I'm wearing gloves, right? Keeping everything nice and clean so that way uh, nobody gets sick. So that's why you'll see me opening up this refrigerator down here and uh, moving things around there as we go. So. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started here. We're going to start by cutting up an onion. We're going to add some red onion into our dish today. So we're going to julienne a red onion. So to julienne this red onion, we're just using half of it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little root end off. We're going to add this root end to our compost bucket, right? So this is where we add all of our compost to. We add all this stuff back into the ground. We actually have an urban garden here in our Charlotte campus where we grow our own vegetables and herbs. So all of the compost that we accumulate, we always just return it back to the soil. Even our paper towels. So you see paper towels in here? Those are biodegradable. So those will break down coffee grounds, coffee filters, eggshells, anything that we use, we will try to return that back to the soil. And uh, what we're going to do, back to julienning our onion, quit talking about compost, Austin, let's get back to here, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of follow the lines of this onion, right? So we're going to take our knife and we're just going to start by making some slices down it just like this. Once you get to about there, I usually just flip this piece over, all right? And we will just keep cutting through it just like that. And then what you're going to get are these little tiny strings of onion there, right? And that is an onion julienne, right? So I'll kind of break up these pieces. And then also, if you're working in a really nice restaurant, you're going to sort through all the pieces. So if you see some pieces that kind of look like this, I'm probably not going to throw that onto the salad um, because of the appearance of it. So we'll put that into compost or we can reuse it in another dish. If we're like cooking down the onions or caramelizing the onions, we'll do that. But we do kind of want to be selective to make sure that everything looks really good. So other than that, things look pretty good here. I'm actually going to take just a small handful of these onions and I'm going to add them 
into uh, this dish over here. And this little dish over here is going to be stuff that I'm going to garnish with. So just a few of the leftover stuff that uh, we didn't use for uh, to initially mix into the salad. We will definitely use that for a garnish. So we'll go ahead and take our onions. We'll add them right into there. Let's throw this back under here. Now let's uh, cut up some more stuff here, right? Let's go with some cherry tomatoes, right? So we got some nice cherry tomatoes right here, nice and ripe. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to slice these in half. You'll notice that I did switch knives as well. We want to make sure that we're using the proper knife uh, for the proper job right? So I do not necessarily need this nice Nakiri knife to cut through these small little uh, tomatoes. So I'm just going to use a little paring knife here to slice through those. I use cherry tomatoes and all different types of stuff, um, even like making sauces. You know, whenever I'm making a red sauce or a pasta sauce, I always throw some cherry tomatoes in there to kind of cook down with everything. Uh, it tastes really, really delicious. So just like with everything else, I'm going to take the majority of them. I'm going to go ahead and add them into the salad. Then I'll take these few that are left, we'll add those to our garnish pile, All right? Go ahead and give our station a quick wipe down here, All right? Uh, next up, uh, that's gonna about do it for the salad, but what we wanna do is make our dressing now, right? So we're gonna be making a vinaigrette dressing today. And a vinaigrette dressing is usually a three to one ratio of oil and vinegar. So we'll take some sesame oil. We'll add that right into the bottom there, All right? Following the sesame oil, we will add some rice wine, vinegar, all right? So add that right into there. After that, we'll add in some fresh squeezed lime juice, all right? Following the lime juice, we'll then add in a little bit of soy sauce, all right? Following that soy sauce, we'll come in with a little bit of powdered ginger, all right? And give it a nice flavor. All right. And then following the ginger, uh, what we will add in is just going to be a little bit of black pepper. Okay. After the black pepper, we're then going to add in some honey. All right. So I've got about a tablespoon of honey measured out here. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hopefully get that out of the dish. Sometimes honey can be a little bit of a pain to work with. All right. So, um, we're going to add that honey right into the bottom here. Right, and that's going to add a nice sweetness to this dish. Right, and a nice sweetness to uh, to the uh, to the dressing. Sorry, couldn't find my words. Happens all the time. All right, so we got the honey in there, and then next up, I want to go ahead and add in some garlic in there too. Right, I'm actually going to add some garlic and cilantro in here. So what I'm going to do with this garlic is I'm actually going to make a garlic paste. The reason why I'm going to make a garlic paste is because I don't just want to mince up garlic, mix it in with everything, because more than likely, even though it's cut up kind of small, probably still going to bite into a little chunk of garlic. And that's nothing that I would want, and I don't think you'd like that either, right? might keep the vampires away, um, but it's not going to taste too good uh, in the short term, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to clean up this garlic by taking the peels off. I'm going to take the root ends of those garlic off. And then what we're going to do is we're going to give it a little chop, right, just like so. Then we're going to add a super secret ingredient over top of our garlic that's going to break down the garlic. And uh, that super secret ingredient is not so much of a secret. It's actually salt, right? So we add some salt right over top of that garlic. Then what you can do is you can cut through it maybe another time. And then you are literally going to watch this garlic disappear in front of you right and we do that by using the salt as an abrasive agent to break it down and the salt is actually going to react with the enzymes in this garlic and it's going to bring out all of the essential oils of this garlic and that's really where a lot of the flavor of the garlic is and this will really help to break it down so that way it'll mix into our dressing really easily but it's also great if you're like sauteing something with garlic right because it's not going to burn as easy so you see how that garlic just completely dissolved on our cutting board that's a garlic paste right there easy as that just garlic and salt right so it comes rough just like that all right and there's your garlic paste now garlic paste can also be used in things like a compound butter so if you want to soften up some butter make a garlic paste like I just did, and then mix in that garlic paste to the butter, let it reharden, and then you can put it over top of a seared 
a seared steak, or maybe you want to put it over top of some crusty bread. You got nice garlic bread. You can use it for that. So our garlic paste is in there. Um, next up, what I want to add into here is going to be some cilantro. So I got some fresh cilantro right here. We are going to go ahead and cut this up again, nice and fine. We don't want anybody to be walking around with giant pieces of cilantro in their teeth or anything. Although it might be kind of funny for us to see, um, we don't want any of our customers to do that. So we're going to make sure that it's nice and small. And again, that way that cilantro flavor can kind of mix in with everything. A few more cuts through our cilantro. And then we're just going to kind of whisk all this together. Make sure we blend the oil and the vinegar together. And uh, when you blend oil and vinegar together, not only are you making a vinaigrette dressing, but the technical name of vinaigrette dressing is called an emulsion, right? An emulsion is the technical name to a vinaigrette dressing. That's blending oil and vinegar together, right? So if you ever want to um, blow some people's minds, if you're at dinner or something like that, and you've got like a balsamic dressing, you say, oh, that's a nice emulsion you got right there, you know? They're like, what in the world's an emulsion? And then there you go. You look super smart. You can tell them about the emulsion. So, okay, we got this mixed together. Kind of show you guys in the camera. You can see there. Looks really nice. But what we need to do is we need to taste it. Because as a chef, tasting food is so important. We have to make sure that the food is up to our standards. I'm not going to serve you something that I don't think tastes right. If it needs a little extra this, a little extra that. You know, I want to make sure that it's just right. So I'm going to taste this. So I'm going to take myself a nice little um, taste here with our tasting spoons. Never taste over your dish. Step away from whatever it is you're tasting and then taste. Don't taste over the dish. That is gross, right? Oh, man. Wow. Hmm. You guys don't want anything to do with this. It's not good. You won't like it. I'm just kidding. It's really, really good. So I'm definitely excited. So we're going to give that another little whisk there. Let's set this right here. I'm going to go ahead and put our dressing down there in our refrigerator. We're going to let that cool off, and we're going to talk a little bit more, and then we're going to get down to business with cooking our steak here momentarily, all right? So um, while that's cooling off and I'm giving a quick wipe down on my workstation here, I did want to tell you guys a little bit more about Johnson & Wales because I know that some of you all – have heard of Johnson & Wales University before, and some of you may have not ever heard of Johnson & Wales University before. And uh, I think that a lot of people, when they hear the name Johnson & Wales, they automatically think of culinary, because that's really where our reputation is at, is culinary and baking and pastry. We're, one, we're known as one of the nation's top culinary programs. One of the world's top culinary programs, you know, and um, so that's why everybody thinks of Johnson Wales as strictly a culinary school, but we're actually much more than just a culinary school. Johnson Wales is a four year private university and a nonprofit university. And aside from culinary arts, we offer around 80 different graduate three majors throughout both of our campuses. Our original campus is in Providence, Rhode Island. It opened up in 1914, um, and uh, it's a really cool town up there in Providence. It's a college town. Um, there's a bunch of schools around us, like Brown University and Ivy League College, the Rhode Island School of Design. So there's a lot of colleges around there. It's a really fun place to be, and that's our main campus. We have around 8,000 students that study there, but the campus closest to you in Charlotte is my personal favorite. Now, I will tell you that is a biased opinion, okay? So it might not be your favorite, but it's definitely mine. I love our campus in Charlotte for so many reasons. Um, one of the reasons being its location. We're right in the heart of Uptown, right on Trade Street and Cedar Street. It's an ultra modern campus. So you can actually walk up the street and look inside of our baking and pastry department where we have these big glass and steel, uh, or we have these big glass pane windows that line the sidewalk there. There's a big tall glass and steel tower on top of the campus. It's just such a really, really cool campus to be at. But more so than what's off campus, I really liked what Johnson & Wales had to offer on campus. Because I was looking for not only a fantastic culinary education, that was first and foremost, but I was also looking for that real college experience. Like when I say that real college experience, I want you to think about schools like USC or Clemson, right? Or College of Charleston, something like that. When you think about those schools, what do you think about? You probably think about sports. 
Maybe you think about living on campus in a dorm room. Maybe you think about involvement on campus, whether there be student government, clubs and organizations, Greek life, something like that. Well, I wanted all of that, but I wanted to go to culinary school. And I didn't find many culinary schools that had that real college experience until I found Johnson and Wales. They offer all of the bells and whistles, like take athletics for an example. Johnson and Wales has a ton of sports throughout our two campuses in Rhode Island and in Charlotte. The big sports on our Charlotte campus are men and women's basketball, volleyball, soccer, cross country, golf, and tennis. Those are the big ones on our Charlotte campus. Now we do have other sports throughout Rhode Island campus such as uh, baseball, wrestling, ice hockey, dressage, that's a horseback riding team, rowing. We have a lot of different sports throughout both of them. And I was not an athlete when I was a student at Johnson & Wales, but it was so much fun to go to those games and cheer on our teams. It was a really, really great time, you know, and to see that some of our All-Americans and our top athletes every year being culinary students or baking and pastry students, something a little bit different. Most of our sports are Division Two or Division Three, and they are in different divisions from our Rhode Island campus to our Charlotte campus. So if you have questions about our sports, just let me know. I'd be happy to answer those. Um, we're also affiliated with a bunch of different fraternities and sororities. So if Greek life is your prerogative, it's on both of our campuses. There's also a ton of different clubs and organizations on our campuses. Clubs and organizations could range from like an art club, to a photography club, to even an ice carving club where students get a 300 pound block of ice. And here's the best part, maybe the worst part about it, I don't know, I'll let you decide. They give you a chainsaw and you get to carve sculptures out of ice with a chainsaw. It's really cool. Um, I've actually done one ice sculpture in my culinary career. And um, I'll be honest with you, there's a reason why I've only done one. That reason is I am horrible at it. For my first last ice sculpture, this thing was supposed to be a squirrel. Um, it looked nothing like a squirrel. It looked like this messed up rat cat thing that got hit by a car. I don't know. It was terrible. I just kicked it over and let it melt. Right? It was awful. But you can do things like that. There's so many ways to get involved. Um, we have dorm rooms here. Our dorm rooms are set up suite style. So in each suite, there's two rooms. Uh, it's you and a room. So there's only two people per suite. You actually have your own bathroom and shower in there, which is really nice. And we even have pet friendly dorm rooms too. So if you want to bring your dog, cat, chinchilla, lizard, I don't know, whatever it is that you have as a pet, you can bring that to campus. You can drive your car as a freshman. You know, it has that university atmosphere. And that's what I loved about it. Now, I do want to say that doesn't make Johnson & Wales better than any other school out there. It doesn't make us worse. It just makes us something different, you know, and something that you might not think about when you think of that culinary experience. So, Anyways, hey, enough about that. Let's get back into our demonstration. Here. So now it's time to cook the steak, right? We are going to pan sear our steak here. So I've actually got some flank steak right here. I got a nice probably four ounce cut of flank steak here. Perfect uh, portion for uh, somebody who's uh, buying the salad from us, right? And we're going to pan sear it. Uh, before we do so, I do want to talk a little bit about how we go ahead and prepare our steak. So I've got the steak cut into a nice portion. I seasoned it with salt and pepper, and it's actually been sitting out for about 20 minutes or so at room temperature. You always want to make sure that you leave whatever cut of meat it is that you're going to be cooking, um, especially a steak out at room temperature. If you're going to grill it, it grills a whole lot better. It has less of a tendency to overcook, right? So I always leave it out to room temperature for about 20 minutes or so. And then we're actually going to add another seasoning right over top of the steak. And that's going to be some coriander, right? So coriander, we're using this because we're actually doing cross utilization right now, right? We've already used coriander in our recipe. Now, where do we use coriander in the recipe? Well, we use cilantro. And you know what cilantro is? The leaf of the coriander plant, right? So if you go overseas or something, most of the time, <clears throat> they don't call it cilantro. They'll call it coriander leaf. This is just the coriander seed that's all ground up, right? So we're cross-utilizing these ingredients, and uh, the coriander definitely gives uh, the steak a really, really nice flavor as well. So I'll go ahead and flip that steak over. When you're seasoning a steak or something, always want to do it nice and up high. Right. Make sure you get good coverage. Right. And then let's go ahead and get our pan nice and hot. Right. So to sear a steak, I do want to start with a little bit of oil and a little bit of fat. So I'm going to start with about a teaspoon of butter. Right. But butter has a very low smoke point. So the smoke point is at what temperature does a fat or an oil burn? 
right? And so with butter having a low smoke point, we need to raise that smoke point. So how do we raise the smoke point? Well, you can do that one of two ways. You could clarify the butter, which means that you cook a bunch of butter in a big pot, all of the milk solids come up as the butter is cooking. You scrape the milk solids off. You can use those milk solids in rice. That's what I usually use milk solids for from the butter. It's delicious. Um, and then uh, you've got clarified butter, almost clear butter. So that has a very high smoke point. Or you can do what I'm doing here, and we can melt some butter with a little bit of oil, right? And that will give it a nice smoke point, and it'll be able to handle uh, the searing of the steak here. So the temperature and the doneness that I'm going for in this steak is a medium rare. Um, that's because that's how I like my steak. If you like your steak a little bit more well done, you know, hey, I understand we can't all be perfect. That's cool. It's your prerogative. You can cook it a little bit longer if you want, but I definitely like to have some red in the steak so that way I can really taste it. So once we see the butter start to melt down there, which is what I'm seeing right here, I'm going to go ahead and take our steak, right? We're gonna go ahead and put that right into the bottom. I'm going to get this dish out of the way. So we are going to move this over here. Why do we do that? Well, I don't wanna put that cooked steak back onto the dish that had the raw steak on there. It's not gonna be good, that's cross contamination. So we wanna make sure that we are being very, very careful with our proteins, right? So I've got a clean dish over here, ready to go as soon as that steak is done. And even though um, I didn't really touch it that much, I will go ahead and wash my hands just to make sure that we are being safe. So, so while this steak is cooking, you might see me occasionally grab a spoon and just kind of put a little bit of that butter and uh, the olive oil over the other side of the steak. Um, that's called basting, so we can butter baste the steak, um, but it's not a true butter basted steak. If I were butter basting a steak, um, like a true version, which, hey, this could be a good demo at some point, um, I definitely have nothing against uh, eating a nice butter basted steak, but I would do it in like a cast iron skillet where you put clarified butter in the bottom there, then you crush some garlic, put that in there, throw some thyme in there as well, and then just kind of toss the butter over top of that steak, and man, it is absolutely delicious. So, so anyway, so I'm going to let that cook just uh, maybe a minute on that side. I'm actually going to check it right now just to see how it looks, right? That looks pretty good. I'm going to flip that piece over there, and I'm going to let it continue to cook, right? So while this steak is cooking, I'll just give it a little shake in there. While that is cooking down, I did want to talk to you guys today about something really, really important. And without a doubt, this is going to be the most important thing that you all hear from me. So if you're only choosing to pay attention to one thing today, I would let this be that one thing because it could help you out a little bit later on down the road. But at the end of the day, folks, college costs money. Now, how many of you all here think college is expensive? I do. It's ridiculously expensive. And you know what? It doesn't matter where you go to school at. It doesn't matter if you go to York Tech. It doesn't matter if you go to Harvard. If you go to USC, Clemson, Johnson & Wales, wherever it is you choose to go, for less or for more, you are going to pay something for your college education. But here's the deal. So many students from your career center, from your area, from your classes now, end up going to Johnson & Wales. We've got a bunch of them. So how do they afford college? Well, they get these things called grants and scholarships. Did you all know that just for being in class today, you've already got a couple scholarships to Johnson & Wales? Well, the reason why, and you can really thank your teacher for this, right? But he actually uses a textbook in his class that's called Culinary Essentials. This textbook was written by our chefs and by our professors at Johnson & Wales. So as a benefit to you all, you can take $1,000 off of your tuition every single year that you're at Johnson & Wales just because you have a textbook in your class. So how do you get this scholarship? Well, on your application, which we'll talk about, but in the middle of the page of your application, you're going to see a question that says, have you used the Culinary Essentials textbook, yes or no? If you check yes, that's $1,000 a year, equaling out to $4,000. Easy as that. Also, your chef utilizes a ProStart curriculum. So you guys are a ProStart school, and I know that your chef is an amazing ProStart educator. So listen up. Take advantage of ProStart. 
ProStart is run through the SCRLA as well as the NRA, the National Restaurant Association, and uh, they give out tons and tons of scholarships through ProStart. For being a base member in ProStart, automatic scholarship. Now, the more involved that you get with ProStart, oof, more money that you're going to receive. So take advantage of everything that your chef is presenting to you at high school, at your high school. Okay. Make sure that you guys are doing that, getting involved, right? As well as with other, other national student organizations, like maybe your home schools, you guys have FBLA, or maybe you have DECA, or maybe you have FFA or Skills USA. Any student organization will get you scholarships, right? As well as your grades, right? And I'm not going to stand up here and just talk about getting good grades all the time because you guys understand. But the better your GPA is, the more merit and academic scholarships that you're going to receive. But you can also find some kind of um, ridiculous scholarships out there. And they give scholarships away for the dumbest stuff. They give scholarships to people who are left-handed, scholarships to people who are really short or really tall, scholarships to people who have records, scholarships to people who wear glasses. If you brush your teeth with Colgate toothpaste, the Colgate toothpaste has a scholarship. If you make your prom dress, your tuxedo out of duct tape, hey, there's a scholarship for you, right? Um, even if you have two left feet, I know it's ridiculous. There's so many scholarships out there. You just got to start looking for them. And I was just kidding about that two left feet scholarship. I just really liked it when I saw a couple of you guys go like this. And look down and realize that you don't have two left feet, right? And no, you don't. I was just kidding about that one. But there's tons of them out there. Um, do you guys hear about this one? Do you guys hear about that scholarship that they give to people who write? If you write a paper on how you would survive the zombie apocalypse, there's a scholarship for that. There's scholarships for anything. So where should you look for these scholarships? Well, first of all, go to Google. Type in crazy scholarships. You'll find tons of them. Go on to fastweb.com, finaid.org. Peterson's.com, Unigo.com, YesCollege.com. There's even a scholarship app. It's called Scholly, S-C-H-O-L-L-Y. If you download this app, you can apply for scholarships straight from your smartphone. It does not get any easier than this, folks. You have to start somewhere, though. So start applying for a scholarship a week, two scholarships a week. I know you're busy. I know you all probably work. You got a lot going on, right? But if you can swing a scholarship a week or two scholarships a week, it will add up. Every penny counts. Every penny counted for me. I didn't have all the money in the world to go to college. I had not been saving up my whole life to go to college. I'm sure you guys have, right? Maybe a couple of you have, but most of you probably not. So start looking for these grants and scholarships. They are out there. Now, there's another way that I wanted to mention to you about how you can get some free money for college. And this comes from the university itself. So as I told you all, Johnson & Wales University is a private and a nonprofit university. And that means several things. One of those things being, you do not charge state or out of state tuition. So if you were thinking, hey, we're residents of South Carolina, neither of your campuses are in South Carolina, I can't afford the out of state, don't worry, I couldn't either. I wasn't a resident of North Carolina or Rhode Island, so I was concerned about that out of state tuition, but they do not charge that. Um, also, once you are accepted to Johnson & Wales, you are accepted to both campuses in Rhode Island and Charlotte. We have literally the same curriculum for our majors. Um, it's just a different campus location. But what this comes down to is that nonprofit side of Johnson & Wales and what we do with our money. Since we're a nonprofit, we're required to give that back to our college and back to our students in the form of financial aid. So where does that financial aid come from and how do you get it? Well, when you apply to Johnson & Wales University, you're going to be required to submit your transcripts. Your transcripts, that's what shows all of your grades, right? So when we receive your transcripts, not only can we get you a decision, but we do what most other colleges don't do. And we send you a financial aid package within your acceptance letter. Most other colleges, you'll be waiting to hear from the financial aid office for another month or two to figure out what you actually got. But for us, it comes immediately to you, all right? So you're going to receive that, and that's going to be based off of your grades. But we also give need-based scholarships. And need-based scholarships, we know how much you need based off of your FAFSA. The FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. And that is money from the federal government that will help you pay for college. 
Now, much like everything else from the federal government, there is a catch to it. And that catch is that it's on a first come and a first serve basis. So if you're a senior listening to this right now, the FAFSA officially opened up October of last year. You are late if you have not done the FAFSA yet. And that money is running out. And when you apply for the FAFSA in March, April, or May, don't be surprised when they tell you that you're not eligible for anything because the money's already gone. So you have to start now. I mean, what if I told you guys that down the street from you all at the Arby's, there's a check for $10,000 with your name on it. How quick could you get down there? I'd imagine you get down there pretty fast. And in that time that you could get from your school down to the Arby's on the corner there, you could have already filled out your FAFSA as well and been eligible for that money. So make sure that you apply for it. You don't have to have your decision made up on a college in order to complete your FAFSA. You can list seven or eight schools on there and every college has their own unique FAFSA code. Ours is 003404. And don't worry if you can't remember that or if you can't remember any of these scholarship websites because I emailed your chef a list of all the links that I sent out. So he's got all those links that he can share with you all, right? But make sure that you fill out your FAFSA and then we can see what we can award you with. Now, there is one last thing in relation to financial aid before we get back into cooking here, all right? And I know it's a lot, but this thing is very important. If you are interested in Johnson & Wales University, you have the opportunity of a lifetime. You have the opportunity that a lot of students don't get. Right. And most students that I have recruited to go to Johnson and Wales from your school, they do this, but they become commuter students. So what's a commuter student? A commuter student is somebody who will live at home and commute to our campus in Uptown for classes. Now, there are upsides and downsides being a commuter student. You guys want the good news or the bad news? Which one? I always go good news first, right? I like good news. Um, so the good news about this is that if you are a commuter student, you're going to save $13,000 off of the top every year at Johnson & Wales because that's what it costs to live on college campuses. If you don't believe me, Google the cost to live at College of Charleston. Google the, uh, the room and board costs at USC or the room and board at Clemson, right? And you're going to see it's around that price range, okay? It could be anywhere from eight to 10 to $13,000, all depends. But you shave that right off the top of our tuition, and then that's even before financial aid. So you factor in your financial aid and you see what you're doing. You are getting a private university education. You're getting a bachelor's of science degree at a private university with the name like Johnson & Wales for what it would cost you to go to a state college or even a community college. Now, everybody's financial aid is different. So I can't say you're going to get this, you're going to get this, you're going to get this. I don't know. We haven't gone through the financial aid process with you, but that's what it's going to end up at, right? And that's a way that you can save some serious money on college. So take it for what it is. Again, we are just an option, but keep those options open. So enough about that, right? Again, I know that's a lot of information coming at you at one uh, point in time, right? So uh, I'm just going to kind of check the steak over here. We've actually had it resting for a little while. That's looking real good. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go ahead and get some garnishes ready, right, for our salad. So we're going to garnish this up real nice, make it look real pretty. Um, add a lot of colors into it as well, right? Even though there's already more colors in there, or there's a lot of colors already in there, we're going to add some more. So, so let's start with our garnishes here, right? So I'm going to go ahead and get my gloves on again. Right. We're going to start with some avocado. i got some avocado right here. I've also got a uh, nice boiled egg. Um, I've also got some sesame seeds and some... Uh, chopped almonds as well. So we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and get everything out of the refrigerator. All right. We've got our dressing right there. We've got the salad right here. What I'll do is I will go ahead and just kind of mix everything together here. All right. You're good. Then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and scoop out our avocado. So I pre-cut this avocado uh, in the first class. This was a gigantic avocado. So I didn't want to use the whole thing in there. I just want to use half of it. Um, but we're going to go ahead and scoop out our avocado here. I'll actually reserve just a little bit of it. I'll mix some of it into the salad here. But that'll go over top of it. Okay. Save that right there. We've got our nice boiled egg right here. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and slice 
that boiled egg open. All right, and perfect. We have our sesame seeds. We've got our chopped almonds right here, ready to go. So let's go ahead and take our dressing here. All right, we're going to pour this dressing over top of the salad. All right, gonna make sure we get every little bit out of here. All right, perfect. Go ahead, get this out of the way. I think we already talked about it, but um, definitely something to reiterate to you guys. You know, uh, as I am going through this dish, you are seeing me clean as I go. So as soon as I am done with something, I am getting it out of the way, right? Moving it to the other side of the demonstration table. Um, also something to note about a salad is we don't want it swimming in dressing, right? We just kind of want to lightly coat the salad with the dressing. And that's why I mean my favorite salad dressings are always going to be like just a little bit of olive oil and maybe even a little bit of balsamic vinegar. That's it. Just separate. Just pour that right over a salad. You know, we oftentimes eat the purpose of a salad when we have something really healthy like this. And then we dump a gallon of ranch dressing into that, which is full of fat, um, which is full of preservatives and nothing super healthy for you. Right. So you're kind of defeating the purpose. So you definitely want to remember that a salad dressing can uh, make it or break it. So. All right, we're going to grab our nice clean plate right here. We're going to grab our salad mix. Right. We're going to add this right into our plate here. Right. And try to keep it all nice together there. Keep everything off of the edges of the plates. Right. After that is done, right? What we're going to do is we're going to take our chopped almonds and add those right over top. All right. We'll then take some of our tuxedo sesame seeds, which is just some black and white sesame seeds. Those will come in here in just a moment as well. Put that boiled egg right there. Prop that up. Go ahead and take some more of our avocado. Kind of put that all around our dish here. All right. Fantastic. And the real star of the show is going to be the steak. Right, and that's coming up here momentarily. We're also going to take a little bit of feta cheese and add some feta cheese right over top. And let's get our steak out of here. Now that I know that I have uh, cut everything up that I need to cut up on the cutting board, we'll go ahead and put the steak right there. We'll do move that out of the way for us. And we're going to go ahead and slice our steak, right? So, again, looking for a nice little pink center in there, right? That's what we're looking for. And that looks beautiful. Fantastic. All right. One more slice through here. All right. Perfect. So, again, that's a nice medium rare that we're going for. That's the temperature that I like my steak to be cooked at. Um, again, if you want it a little bit uh, more well done than that, you can most certainly do that. But I like it just like that. We'll also take a few of our vegetables that – remember when I was talking about how we're going to save some of these veggies for a garnish? That's exactly what we're doing here. All right, so we're going to put a few of those on there just to kind of spruce up the color a little bit more. All right. Then what we'll do is we'll take some slices of our steak. We're going to add that right over top of our dish here. All right. Then what we'll do is we will take some more of our sesame seeds right here, put that right over top. All right. Take the rest of our feta cheese that's going over the top and then maybe just a little bit of our salt over top of there as well and then this is our final product right so a real nice steak salad right there and uh, what we're also going to do um, you'll learn this if you work in a nice restaurant or if you do like uh, culinary competitions you'll learn about plate wipes right so uh, we ideally want to keep everything off of the edge of the plate we want everything inside of the plate so i'll just go ahead and take a clean paper towel and we'll just wipe that down just to make sure that it looks really really nice but that is our steak salad so super healthy uh, very tasty um, a lot of great flavors and i think it looks really good too so uh, few last, yeah, thank you. A few last things that I want to 
mention to you all today before we uh, do a little question and answer session. Um, and please don't be shy if you guys have questions. We definitely want to uh, answer any of those questions that you may have. But a few last things I want to talk to you about today. Um, if what I've told you today sounded good and you want to know what your next steps are, your next step would be to apply. Applying to Johnson and Wales University is really, really easy. You can apply at any time through our website at jwu.com. Or if you just Google Johnson and Wales, click on apply, you'll see the uh, apply now button. Um, also, your chef does have the application link as well. So our application is free. There's no cost to apply. That's a really easy money grab for a lot of uh, colleges, but we don't charge an application fee. Um, when it comes to getting accepted, we require a minimum C average. That does not mean that everybody with a C average gets in. We do look at you as a whole. So on your application, you're going to have ample opportunities to tell us about yourself, right? Not just about your grades. You're going to have ample opportunity to put in if uh, maybe you helped out with a catering event um, at your school, or maybe you work at a restaurant or you work here, or you do this after school, or you do that, do you play sports? Are you uh, a volunteer somewhere? What is it, what, who are you as a person? You can put in uh, recommendation letters. So if you have a chef or a teacher that can write you a letter of recommendation, you can put that in there. Or if you wanna write an essay on your behalf, you can put that in there as well. But we don't require a set SAT or ACT score for an acceptance either. I definitely encourage you to take the SATs and the ACTs, but remember that it's not gonna be a make it or break it thing. It's not going to negatively affect you. So make sure that you apply and let's see what we can do for you. Because the way that I see it, if you apply to Johnson and Wales and you get accepted, does that mean that you have to go to Johnson and Wales? No, not at all. It's just an option. And if you happen to not get accepted, you didn't lose any money on your application. So let's see what we can get worked up for you. Um, I also want to encourage you all to visit Johnson and Wales. And not just Johnson and Wales, folks, visit every college you are interested in. Do not ever make a split second decision on a college or make a decision on a college that you have not physically been to. They can make schools look amazing on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. They make them look great. But if you haven't physically been there, you have no clue, right? So visit. We offer virtual as well as in-person tours, right? Virtual tours are a ton of fun. You get to actually uh, talk to a current student here. Um, it's a great time. And then our in-person tours are very limited. Um, they are limited to one family at a time. So uh, make sure that you register in advance so that way we can get you out on a tour to where we keep things nice and safe. We have a lot of safety precautions put into place to keep our students safe, uh, our faculty and staff safe as well right? And then you can also choose to cook along with us too. So we host cook along events in collaboration with our Providence campus. Um, the next cook along event is on February 15th with my coworker, Chef Jeff, um, who's going to be teaching you how to make a molten chocolate lava cake. So what we do is after you sign up for this event, it's a free event. Um, we send you a uh, ingredients list and a recipe. You are required to go out and get your ingredients, but we keep it very affordable. So it's all things that you can find at Walmart. And then you sign on to our Zoom link and we all cook together. And it's a great time. We just go ingredient by ingredient. So if you want to sign up for one of those, make sure you do that as well. That that link will also be uh, in the links that your chef has. So speaking of that, I do want to uh, go ahead and check in with you guys, see if there are any questions that you might have. That's going to really be about all the information that I have. Um, but if you guys have some questions, I definitely would love to answer those. Anything from uh, stuff about Johnson & Wales to my favorite things to eat and cook, uh, to financial aid or anything that you all want, love to answer those questions for you. So I'll kind of turn the floor back over to you guys to see if you have any of those questions. Uh, you have, I know a lot of information speaking. Does anyone have questions they'd like to ask? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I do that. Uh, let, let me warm you up a little bit. Maybe you'll think of something. <laughs> So I do, have, I do have a couple of questions. So um, I know that you do get a lot of students who come to you who have gone through the ProStar uh, course. Do, you, do, do your instructors see a difference between those who, who have done that versus those who uh, didn't get that opportunity during high school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we can definitely tell a difference. You know, um, like I mentioned previously, we, we do have students that come to Johnson and Wales from 
all different walks of life. So I remember when I was a student at Johnson Wales, um, there was a guy in my class that had been cooking in restaurants. He was actually an international student and he was from Romania and he had been cooking in restaurants in Romania for a very, very long time. And he came to Johnson and Wales. He didn't have a degree or anything like that, but he knew a ton more about culinary than I did, than most students in the class did. And then we also get students that come to Johnson and Wales that never had the opportunity to take a foods class in high school. So all walks of life come to Johnson and Wales to learn how to cook and you learn from everybody. But to the point of your question, we can absolutely tell. So if we put a test group of, you know, six students or whatever into a culinary lab, we gave them a recipe. We said, execute this recipe. Right. And we had our chefs watching them. They would absolutely be able to tell who was in pro start and who was not right because it's just really it prepares you for the industry and it prepares you for the next step uh to culinary school very very well so to reiterate take advantage of everything that ProStart is giving to you um, because it will help you out not even just if you even if you choose to go to another college it will help you out right but we can absolutely tell where our ProStart students are at excellent question chef and so another one I had was about, and I know that right now the world is upside down, and so it's, it's a different kind of world. But I know that you have some study abroad program, which uh, which hopefully you know, over the next couple of years will be back in progress again. Can you tell us a little about those, please? Sure, absolutely. So we do have a really great travel abroad program. Um, we send students all over the world, um, anywhere from uh, Asia to Europe to South America and everywhere in between. And yes, you are correct. The pandemic has definitely limited that as to be expected, but I know that it will come back and we will be able to travel internationally again. And we send students all over the place. Um, students, I will tell you this. I have one major regret from my education at Johnson and Wales, and that regret is that I did not do travel abroad. Um, I definitely could have done travel abroad very easily, um, but I didn't do it. Um, I don't know if it was because I was working or, you know, I, I don't know why I didn't choose to do travel abroad, but um, in hindsight, I should absolutely have done it. Um, however, I'm very fortunate, though, because my coworker, Chef Jeff Harris, actually did a travel abroad. And that's the great thing about these virtual presentations, even though I, I definitely prefer the in-person, but I think it's great that I can bring my coworker in to tell you a little bit about his travel abroad and where he went, what he got to do, um, and some of the exciting things that he saw. So let's turn it over to Chef Jeff and hear what he has to say about his travel abroad program. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chef and Eddie. Um, so yeah, everyone, my name is Chef Jeff Harris, and I essentially have the same job title and position as Chef and Eddie. Uh, I actually get to travel a little bit further north. So I go uh, primarily in Virginia, but a little bit in north, um, some South Carolina and uh, Maryland. And during my time at Johnson Wales, so I also went for the culinary arts and food service management degree. Uh, but during my time here, I did have the opportunity to study abroad. Um, and for my selection, I chose to go to the Sommelier Studies program. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Sommelier, essentially it is the wine steward of a restaurant. So they're in charge of ordering the wine, um, looking at pricing on the menu, making sure that they're curating the list and getting the right things and working with the chef to make sure that the food and wine pairings and the flavor profiles all sort of mash up together. So with my experience, I spent about a month in Germany. And uh, during that, we took one of those weeks and we actually got to travel through Europe. So uh, we went up and down France and we also got to check out Luxembourg and see some different vineyards um, and learn about how the terroir and the soil and the climate can influence the end product. Um, so overall, I had a really amazing time there. Um, we stayed in a hotel, so all lodging was taken care of. I didn't have to stress about like, where am I going to stay or what am I going to eat? We had meals sort of provided for us. Um, every morning, we had a really great German breakfast before we would go upstairs to the classroom. And since everything was sort of in one place, I didn't have to stress about where do I go or what do I do? It, it sort of made the travel experience really easy and allowed us to take part in another culture and sort of see how they do things over there. Um, so I definitely recommend if you have that opportunity, 
go ahead and do a study abroad, um, whether it's in Germany like I did or in France or Italy or South Africa or Spain. We have them all over the place where you can study a variety of different things and visit many different countries in the world. So from here, I'm going to turn it back over to Chef Vanetti. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Very cool experiences. So thank you for uh, asking that question, Chef. Greatly appreciate it. And the, uh, the last thing I just wanted to ask you about, because I've had a few students inquiring about this, um, and I know you, you kind of hinted on this, but uh, going into maybe a little more depth on the fact that some students are talking about going to community college first before they go uh, to Johnson and Wales uh, as a different route, and, and the pros and cons with that. Good question, Chef. And uh, I want to start by saying, students, there is absolutely nothing wrong with community colleges at all or going there for a year or two. Don't ever think that anybody's going to look down on you for going to a community college. Uh, community colleges are absolutely incredible. And remember where I told you that I looked first was community colleges. I'm a believer in community colleges. I know people at community colleges all across the state of South Carolina, and they have fantastic programs. Nothing wrong with that at all. Now, where his, where your chef's question is in lie is where um, you want to go to a community college first to take a few classes and then transfer those to a college like Johnson & Wales. First of all, you can do that, right? Your credits will transfer. However, if you choose to take culinary or baking, at that community college, those culinary and baking credits will not transfer. And the reason why is we have a completely different culinary program. Now, if you go to community college and take English, math, science, history, those credits will transfer. Do you see what I'm saying there? Academics will transfer, culinary will not, just due to the sheer uh, magnitude of our culinary program right? And that's just where it lies. But here's what I want you to understand is that you need to look at your options. So what you need to do, especially since Johnson and Wales has a free application, you need to apply to Johnson and Wales first. And let's see what the financial aid is going to be, because this is a little insider secret, right? Something that you will learn if you are a transfer student. But as a transfer student, you'll probably earn about half the scholarships that you would as a traditional freshman student. So I would encourage you to look at it as going to a school like Johnson and Wales first, straight out of high school. And if that's not going to be affordable for you, then maybe the community college would be the best route for you. Um, but most of the time, community colleges are going to have a free application. We have a free application, so you're really not going to lose anything. I would just start doing your research and apply to a school like us first um, and see what type of financial aid we can get cooked up for you. And again, if it works, that's awesome. If it doesn't, you can hit community college, knock out some academics, transfer them over to us. Awesome. Thank you. And actually, I got one more question for you. And that's actually a question that I ask all of my students beginning of each semester because it does change between intro level one and level two as well it's kind of fun to see what's your favorite dish in the world <laughs> well, the uh, the chef answer to that would be any dish that uh, I'm getting paid to cook, right? <laughs> but, uh, my favorite dish in the world um, would be my grandmother's chicken parmesan. Uh, my grandmother, uh, she, my grandparents basically raised me. My dad was a single dad and uh, my dad worked all the time in a factory. And um, so my grandparents raised me and my grandparents uh, have always just cooked an amazing dinner every single night. And chicken parm is one of those ones that uh, me and every one of my other family members, every time that we all get together, it's what's on the table. And she does it unlike anybody else. She always says, oh, it's so easy. There's nothing to it. Anybody has better chicken parmesan than me. That's uh, not true, right? So that is my favorite thing in the world to eat. Great question awesome. though, Chef. Awesome, thank you. That's brilliant. Now, is, before we finish up, does anyone have anything they wanted to ask you all right. Well, if they do, then I'll certainly pass that on to you. But uh, did you have anything else you wanted to say to finish up? 
Uh, I want to say thank you to all of you students for uh, lending me your ears and eyes today. I definitely hope that you all took something away from this presentation. Um, and uh, I wish nothing but success in your future. And I know that is what's in store for you. Um, please keep in touch. If there's anything that I can do, listen, your chef has all my contact information. We talk a lot. So let him know if you have questions. If you say, hey, I'm confused about the application or I need to know how to visit or I need this or that, just let him know, right? He'll get in touch with me and we'll make sure that you're taken care of. Um, again, to reiterate, I also know people in the admissions world for colleges all across the state of South Carolina. So even if it's not Johnson & Wales related, I would love to help you out, right? If I can get you to where you need to be, I'll make it happen for you, okay? Um, also, students um, in your Google Classroom today, I sound like a teacher. In your, in your Google Classrooms today, you are going to see a little registration link. And that registration link is what's going to give me credit for speaking to you all today. If at some point today you guys could click that link, fill it out, put as much info as you want in there or as little. doesn't bother me one way or the other. But that's just so my bosses see how many students that I spoke to. And so they know that I didn't just make all this beautiful steak salad while I'm sitting at home binge watching Netflix. Um, so uh, make sure that you guys do that for me. And um, I do want to say, Chef Hawks, thank you so much for everything that uh, you have done for your students. And thank you for allowing me to speak in your class. Um, really, the honor is all mine to be able to speak to uh, your classes. So thank you so very much for your continued support. And uh, Johnson & Wales will continue to support you in anything that you need or anything that your students need. So thank you, Chef. Brilliant. Well, I'd, have, I'd like to say thank you to both you, uh, Chef Vanessa and uh, Chef Harris, for putting on this. And uh, I've had several different classes, so you, you've really gone uh, up and above and beyond uh, to make this happen. So we, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And, and we'll, be, we'll be staying in touch, Chef, because I'm sure there'll be, there'll be questions coming back and forth. Let's do it. Absolutely, Chef. I look forward to talking to you soon. Awesome. Cheers. Cheers. We'll see you later. Take care, Chef.